had that for a little over 10 years. Um, and uh, I don't actually have another um, timer, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, I have not given this presentation before, first time through, so I apologize if there are any bumps. Um, we'll, should be fine for the most part. I have no idea how long it's going to run. Could be half hour, could be, well, it'll stop at 40 minutes ago. Um, the, uh, the bait that I threw into the, into the stuff to put out was the end of education and um, a fairly, what I thought was mildly provocative statement at the end of it about uh, that I actually had found, but um, I have uh, since, um, come on, can it work for me, can it work, can it work, can it go, huh, no, no, can not make me press the button, huh? Yeah, come on, really? Like standing up and turning the TV channel. Yeah, yeah right? shorter than you thought so. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you have to deal with this. Like, so I came across this. Uh, this is a paraphrase of the quote because I decided not to go get the actual quote and not to name the person and not to put that out because I thought it was going to be a little bit too harsh. But I have seen this sentiment around a lot of places. There are too many pictures and slideshows and students, I feel bad for them sitting in the dark with their pencil and nothing to do because there's nothing to copy from this screen to the paper. And that's the point for a lot of stuff. So today I'm going to talk about technology, I'm going to talk about education, and we're going to talk about this one technology that is very, very important. It is something that uh, is portable. It's as random access, you can use it with dialogue, you can use it asynchronously, you can use it synchronously, you can use it anywhere. And it's very important. But it's also a little dangerous. Wow. <laughs> it's so cool. It's a new version. I had to try out all the, I to try out all the stuff. But it's a little dangerous. So that all of these things, because because of all these things, we lose a little bit of control. Control over what the information that the students get is, control of the distribution of that inf uh, information. It, it is a distraction in the classroom. It is, it makes the stuff that has been used before not work as well. Right? So, how many people know what I'm talking about? And were you right? <laughs> right? So I'm talking about the printed book. And our villain today is actually this guy. Johann Gutenberg. Because the printed book was the antithesis of the medieval university. Students, how, how are students going to be able to do what education is if everybody already has a copy of the book? That's what lecture is. So it's a little bit brighter day, uh, but we need to take a look at where where does this come from, right? What makes books so special? And we need to start with the scrolls, because scrolls really you need to have both hands to use and, and both hands and some space, right? It's not portable. You can't use it on the train. You can't use it in the car, <laughs> right? You need you need some space and you need more than just you to be able to deal with it. So we improved this a little bit and we went to the codex. And the codex is fantastic. It's portable. You can take it with you, tuck it under your arm, and take it with you to any library that you want to go to, although there probably weren't very many libraries at the time. You can make your own notes in it. And the great thing is, you had to make it yourself. And this is where we came up with the original idea of lecture. Because we had codexes, we didn't have books. A little different. In a codex, it's a copy. It's a copy of a book. So, if someone is saying, "All right, please turn to page 50," we all know now that if you turn to page 50, your page 50 and your page 50, as long as you have the same edition, is going to be the same page 50. But during the time of the codex, 
maybe page 50 was the same. Maybe you had more than one page 50. Maybe you didn't have page 50. Maybe the scribe skipped page 50, right? Or, or it had an entire, it was page 50 from a different book, right? These are all possibilities. And so lecture was, the teacher would stand in front, the professor would stand in front, read the book, and you would make your own copy. And that was a really critical way to get information from one place to another. And these were really valuable. It was a really highly important aspect of that time in education. And if you wanted a book, you had to go to where the book was. You couldn't just go down to the library and pick up a new one. If you wanted a particular book by a particular author, you probably had to travel. Because that book was probably owned by a lord in a different area. And if you were lucky, it would be there when you got there. And if you were really lucky, the Lord, whoever owned the actual book, would let you go see it. And so we got this. In the medieval universities, we had one person in the front and all the students listening and writing down all of the information that came out of the professor's mouth because that was the only access to the information that they had. And he ruined it. <laughs> and the medieval universities fought tooth and nail. They did not want books. They did not want anything to do it because if one person had a book, then everybody would have a book. And, uh, longer than I thought, and, and how are students going to learn if they don't know how to make their own books? Right? So, all of this really does have a parallel to today's world. Right? The technology changes, but the, the music is still the same. Right? How many people know this guy? He's not too much in the news anymore. It's uh, Eric Schmidt, and he worked at Google. Right? And a couple of years ago, uh, he came out and was at a tech conference and had mentioned, or put out, every two days, we create as much information as was from the beginning of time to up until about 2003. Now, this is a slight exaggeration, but he was really only off by a couple of days, more like a week, right? And so this is a problem for education. It's a problem for what we do. It's a problem that is uh, that can be signified by what happens. Let's take a look in March 2010. 24 hours every minute is uploaded to YouTube. And then, just six months later, this number goes up to, this number goes up to, in November, uh, 35 hours a minute. Anybody know what it is today? No? Right. Google it. Yeah, Google it. <laughs> today, and uh, as of last night, uh, YouTube stats state that it's 100 <laughs> hours of video is uploaded to YouTube every minute. This is a different kind of problem than these guys were doing. Right? So this is a rarity of information. And we have a plethora of information. And the, the type of information that we have doesn't even really work for these things. So it's, uh, fortunately, I don't have to explain this to you. Really, anybody to old people? <laughs> oh, you don't know? All right. Yay! All right, so this will be good. <laughs> we'll, come, we'll come back and visit that one in a minute because, first, a, a quick note from the American Library Association that should terrify you. Uh, by 2020, the amount of information on the internet will double every 15 minutes, and this is a geometric progression that is not linear. So that means if you have a uh, one hour class that it will have doubled four times. That means if you start at one, by the time you get out, it will be what, uh, two, four, eight, 64 times more information by the end of that one hour class than you had walking in. Not just double, right? but double again and again and again. So this is an information problem, but we need to put a pin in it because uh, I want to ask this other question. Nobody's going to want to raise their hand, but I'm going to ask you 
please be honest, be strong, <laughs> and put it out there. And how many people have said this? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, okay, now, can I keep your hands way, way up? All right, so how many people have kept that promise? Ooh. Oh. Wow, good job. Oh, yeah. Good job. Smartphone. Smartphone. Smartphone only. Yeah, but it still, it still counts. <laughs> because this is the next one. How many people said, I will never, ever get a Facebook account? And how many of you have caved? You may raise your hand or lower your hand. Caved or? Caved. You got one at one point. Yeah, but use other people's accounts. That counts. I'm keeping it. All right. So this is one of those things. We say we don't want to do it. We don't want to do it. We're not going to do it. No, absolutely. Okay, fine. Because everybody else is doing it. And we need to drop that idea of what's not good for education, what is education, what is not education. And uh, because this is really what it leads to. I will never use tech in class. Well, Hoping for actual blackboard. This is still technology. Right? This is technology. That's technology. That's technology. So you are going to use it. You want to or not, it doesn't matter. But how you're going to use it, how you're going to incorporate it into the class does matter. And why you're going to do it, or why you're going to incorporate it in the way that you do is also very important. Because as much as we like. I was supposed to do that. As much as we might pine for the old days, this is never coming back. At least it's not going to come back in the same way. We have an abundance of information. We have access to it 24-7. It's in our pocket. And so we need to really start looking at a different way to deal with this because this is shut. Right? It's not coming back. We need to come back to this information problem that we were talking about before and take the pen up. Uh, what we're really dealing with is how to assess information, what's important, what the students need to know, what the students don't need to know, what they need to have instant recall for. Why do we have tests? I have 15 minutes, half hour. Because they serve the purposes of the system. Which is what? Purposes of the system. Um, to continue the system. That's just to keep track of how we're doing. Keep track of how we're doing. For what goal? Um, so that um, we can learn more. Yeah, better, I mean, who's giving the test and why? I mean, there's a lot of variety. I mean, just like, like I was saying earlier, testing yourself is, right. is a way to teach yourself. Right. It's a way to strengthen your knowledge. Why do schools have tests so that they can assess students and decide who deserves to finish and not? Let's, but let's, okay, let's go back to the actual reason. I mean, not actual reason, okay, my opinion, actual reason. What's, what's the goal of tests? What's the purpose of that thing? To give a reason for learning in the first place? No. Nope. <laughs> to get information about whether they learn. Yes, close. Okay. Uh, the idea, <laughs> as I'm looking at it today, at any rate, is if you need to write a paper, if you need to do research, if you need to be able to discuss something with somebody on the fly about the thing, where do you need to have the information? In the book, in the library? In your head. In your head, mm -hmm. right? It needs to be instant access. You need to have access to it where you are at the time. That's why my math teacher and I got in a huge fight about whether or not I needed to know uh, the Pythagor Pythagorean theorem. And I lost because I needed to know it because he wasn't going to let me write it down. Um, so I did like before the class, I'm like, eh, okay, and then as soon as I sat down for the test, that was the first thing I wrote on the side on the margin. So the reason we have tests is because we want to kind of try to get rid of this thing and cut down on the time. So everybody but Megumi remembers how much of a pain this is. You go, you're going to write a paper, you go to the library, I'm going to write a paper on my topic, okay, I got, but, but I can't go just straight to the book and find out what that topic, and get the book on that topic, I have to figure out what the librarian is going to call that topic. 
And then I got to figure out, all right, so I call it uh, bridge building. Oh, they're calling it civil engineering all right, or structural engineering. So I go figure out where the structural engineering section is, and then I go to the card. And I'm still not there. Still don't have the information. I'm not even at the book. I don't even know which book it is, book it's in. I go here. I look up where the book is, and then get three or four different possibilities for where that book is. And then I get to go for a walk where, around the rest of the library, figure out. Oh, here's the book. Here's the book. Here's the book. Pull those down off the shelf. Go down to a table, and open the book and start reading through. Oh, that's not what I want. Oh, this book isn't what I want either. And this last one that I got also is not what I want. So I, all of that time, trying to figure out where it is in the card catalog, where that is in the library. Once you find the book, then uh, you go through and try to find it. And it's probably not there, maybe. But all of that is gone. But the point of memorization for tests was to cut down on this process because the more of it you had in your head, the less time you had to spend here, right? If you knew, all right, throw said this about that, it was in Walden, all I got to do is find Walden, I go straight to it, it probably been there, right? This, to steal a joke, is a linear access device. You start at the beginning and you have to go through each piece to get to the end. This. You can start at the beginning, you can jump to the end, put your finger in the middle, and you know, hold three or four pages, you have bookmarking, fantastic. If you have a nice one, you get pictures, so it's multimedia. Okay. And this, not come up, but I was supposed to. This day is pretty much gone. However, it's gone for the construction of the knowledge. However, it's not necessarily gone for things that people do, right? So if you are a daijusan, if you're, if you're a carpenter, this is still important because you have to get out there and you have to do it. Build a chair, then sit in the chair. If it breaks, then you fail and you do it again, right? Language works similarly, or at least it's an idea. And all of this is to get rid of this. So, um, or to reduce the time spent here, because we can do a lot of the preliminary stuff on devices like this, right? So, does that mean there's no value? I phrased the question wrong. <laughs> <laughs> phrased it backwards. Um, is it sad that, that these old technologies are gone? Yes. Are they completely useless? No. There's still a lot of things that we can get out of it. Uh, it's just not going to be the same way that it was before. Can we use these new tools in classrooms to develop our stuff? Yes, and one thing that we really do need to remember is uh, what's happening in the world today. Because 10 years ago, if you would have told me that somebody with a video camera like that could go out and make several million dollars a year here, I would have not known anything what you're talking about because 10 years ago, I didn't know about this. It was only two years old at that point. 15 years ago, YouTube didn't exist. Blogger didn't exist. Webmaster or web designer web designer really wasn't even around. It was a webmaster, and it was some dude who wrote down code for their uh, website on a piece of paper and then retyped that into a computer and hoped it worked the first time so it didn't have to be done. Uh, Ten years ago, those jobs didn't exist. Some of the system engineers, app developers didn't exist because that job didn't exist. Right? There are applications, but it's a different ballgame. So, if anybody here can tell me what the jobs are going to be 10 years from now, tell me, because that's the magic. We're training students for jobs and skills and a world that in 10 years, we won't recognize it. We wouldn't recognize it now. And at that point, be like, well, of course, that's just that, yeah. Right? So 
It's a big question. Okay. Yeah, you could. There's a question. That was great. <laughs> um, so there's a big question. Is this the end of education? Well, yeah. It's the end of education. It's the end of education in the Middle Ages. Those days are gone. We have printed books. Uh, we have classes. We have ways to be able to do things now in a way that is absolutely magical compared to what Gutenberg did then. If I want to publish a book to the world in the next hour, I can do it and have it be available in every country in the world to purchase. Right? That's something that was not possible even three years ago. But it is possible today. Um, so I ran this a little short. My name is Scott Chanel. Here's my address. <laughs> I am an Apple extinguished, uh, distinguished uh, educator. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, if, if you have any questions, I know I didn't do a lot of classroom specifics. So, but yes. Is there an app for this? There is. This is Keynote. <laughs> oh, no, not for that. Oh, for what? I mean, for all of this taking of information and figuring out what to do. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> but if you make it, they will come. <laughs> yes, sir. So, this is, it's an interesting question. What does it say about the lecture format as a pedagogical approach to teaching? I think it's... Uh, an interesting blip in history, really. Because if you think about all of human history, how do people learn in general? It was a student who became an apprentice to somebody who knew what was going on, and they worked with them, they lived with them, they you know did all of the stuff, and then they went out and did it on their own. So lecture, I think, as it started at this time, I think enjoy it because you only have about another 10 or 15 okay maybe a hundred but basically another 10 or 15 years as soon as we can shake it off I think it's gone well the access students have to the internet that changes the power relationship yeah. between teacher and student right? <clears throat> levels of playing field so yeah. basically the teachers as a teacher is becoming antiquated we're more a facilitator and that's yes. why that peer learning is so important. Exactly, exactly, and that's exactly it. And so it's not the teacher as the font of knowledge. It's, it, it was really never that. It, it, that was how it ended up, but it was never the teacher as the font of knowledge. The teacher is a guide. And if you we go back and take a look at, at that idea of uh, information on the internet doubling every 15 minutes, do you think teachers are more necessary or less necessary? Because that idea of assessment of information which information is good and which information is bad, that's what teachers need to be able to instill in the student. Um, and so that's where our role will become. Yes, we'll have the knowledge because we'll have the experience, but getting them to be able to find the knowledge on their own because the students are going to be self-motivated. If you want, tomorrow you can get a doctoral education from Harvard and for free. You just don't get the piece of paper. But you can get the education. Everything is available online. Um, whether it's your way, you want, the way you want to study or not, then it's difficult. Just a slight wrinkle on that. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, end of end of lecture. I don't know. Maybe end of the or changing of delivery of lectures. I mean, right now, one of the. Well, what does lecture mean to you before you? Well, one person talking to you. Right. A more one-way communication. Yeah. And just an example of that is, you know, very popular these days is Coursera, the on free online university courses you can take, which is still lectures by a professor. You're watching right. a video. Now again, you know, they can just use that over and over and over. Yeah, but, but it's still a lecture, and that's you know, hot trend right now. Yeah, it's. But even that, as soon as somebody has develops the app that lets you do it as an interactive, you, you remember Eliza. Yes. Yeah, it's it's like that. As soon as somebody develops an interact, interactive artificial intelligence that you can ask questions to, and they will go through their database and deliver that information back, then the can stuff. So you have to have yeah. the right questions for that. Well, yeah. now, yeah, <laughs> but uh, one, two, and then three. Sorry. Um, following on from you, uh, you mentioned exchange of information and yeah. so on. But what happens to human contact? 
and to exchange of affection rather than uh, information, or both? Uh, well, is I think it, an end, or I think it, I think no, 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 no. I, it will never end as long as there's people. Because uh, the computers and all that can never replace this uh, exchange. Of I disagree. I have as close a relationship with my mother now as I ever had when I much closer now than I ever was in college. So it will, never, it will never die. I don't think so. No, no we're, we're people. We we, we we need that. This is just a mediation device, as far as that goes. It's going to be more uncomfortable for you than it will be for a third grader. For teachers as motivators. Yeah, yeah. But the human connection is always there. So if you think about two people sitting at dinner, both of them looking at their keitai, not talking to each other, they are talking to people, just not the person in front of them, and probably they're happier that way. Yes, sir. Um, this is kind of a vague question, but anyway. So, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, it's our students today, they have access to lots of knowledge. Mm. They all have smartphones. Doesn't mean anything to it. But, <laughs> firstly, they, they know very, very little about anything, I think. And also, they don't think deeply about anything. True. Um, and this hasn't changed since I first came to Gaidai, which was 27 years ago. True. So despite the internet, students still know very little, and they don't think very deeply about anything, except what's right in front of them. So, and we are still, I think, we are still vastly more knowledgeable and more experienced than our students. And I think we've thought a bit more about life and the world than our students, I think. So, how can we guide students to, to just think a bit more deeply about the world and life? How can we guide them? Like, what's, yeah, what actually, it's, that's a, it's a really good question. It's a really good question. I don't, um, and I don't want to make light of it. It's, uh, I think the key is to find those aspects of your story. Think of, if you think about education as story instead of as a list of knowledge, find those aspects of your story that you, that move you, and show how that moves you and let the students talk. There will always be the vacuous 18 people, or you know, whatever, that are around, and they they will be there. Uh, there's nothing we can do, but they were there when I was in college. I'm sure they were there. Uh, there was a great website, and I was trying to find it, and I because that was the other half of what I wanted to do with this particular speech, is the children these days are stupid. The, the children these days can't learn anything. And that quote, or that idea of quote, has gone back for the past 200 years, and it's, a, it's almost word for word the same. And so the next generation is always never as good as your generation, and your parents thought your generation. You know, it's, it's that, that aspect is there, but the key is find the gold pieces, the shiny spots in your story, and make sure that the students, try to get the students to see it and feel it as much as you can. So very touchy-feely for that guy. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but it's 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 there. Yeah. But there there will always be. Uh, they're very surface. They're very shallow. But maybe the other side is as from an older generation, we're the shallow ones because we're not interested in what they're interested. In. Mm -hmm. You know, it, yeah. there is a way to there is a way to pivot that. Yeah. I promise you. Thanks. What do you think about uh, flipped classroom methodologies and what's, what do you think the timeline is for that? Soon. But what is it? Ten years. Flipped classroom. It's like mm -hmm. Khan Academy, where oh. you, you take the lecture. Yeah, I hate it. Outside that. of class, well, the students never are doing. <laughs> the students are doing the lecture ah, outside of class, and they do work homework and activities in class. Teachers. All right. Let's get rid of this. this. Oh. <laughs> Denied is not right. All right. So this um, one way to deal with this. One way to deal with this is. Uh, this method, this model for implementing technology in the classroom, the first idea is substitution. I wasn't sure if I'd get to it, so I didn't add it to the thing. Uh, this is the simple substitution of technology for uh, a previous technology. So this is kind of that whole idea of the old technology is obsolete. To get to the flipped classroom, the students are doing the work outside, and it's a lot like what Chris was talking about this morning. 
he's having them write and stuff out there. He's spending the classroom time to focus on polish and uh, really what's there for him to correct the part that he's needed for. He's not, it's not necessary for him to do the other pieces. They do it outside of class and then come to him and he corrects. So next up, augmentation. So the augmentation aspect of it is, okay, it's like a book, but it also has video and audio and stuff like that, and you can fit it in your pocket, and you can have a thousand of them with you at one time. So it's something, substitution is just a one-to-one -one replacement. So the technology is doing exactly the same thing as the old one did. Augmentation is now it's doing a little bit more. What does the end mean? I'll Google it. Yeah, if you would, that'd be awesome. Do the R yeah. while he's Googling it. Reduce. Mm -hmm. Reduce. Modification. Modification. And I didn't Google it. But that wasn't in your habit. You know how it's recall. <laughs> <laughs> took a long time. Our card catalog. Is <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Start thinking of the R because the one that's in my head is going to work. So modification, it's going to be very different. It's, it's, it will do way more than the original one did. It is almost becoming a different thing. And this is going to be re, a redefinition of that idea. It's going to be something entirely new that was not even possible when the technology was merely a substitution. And so as a step for uh, bringing technology into the classroom. Just straight substitution is okay. If your students don't have to carry a, you know, uh, three kilograms <coughs> worth of paper with them, then that's a good thing. Bad news is students hate Kindles. Um, the, the, there's a Princeton study on uh, implement, using Kindle as a textbook, and the problem was kind of one of, something that this doesn't really do very well, can't write the margins, right? And so that's one of the things that people got really stressed out about. So the idea of a digital book and a digitized book are not the same, right? So a digitized book is just getting the words into the machine. A digital book has some sort of interaction, and that interaction will depend on where they are, uh, who they're interacting with, maybe they can ship something to the teacher and the teacher can put something back, you can have an instant communication through that at the time. So is that in the making to be able to write, to annotate in the margins? Well, you can do that in a PDF. Book? You can do that? Yeah. There, I mean, how easy though is that? Or is it, right now mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's uh, I think yeah, early days. Yeah. It's rocks and sticks. But I'm sure with time. Uh, give it five years. Because and that was the technique that my students liked the most. Give it five years, the and class. the camera that's already there will be able to. Uh, the camera that's already there, you can put video annotations in. So. You know, it's interesting. This brings up the question of cell phone cell phone use in the classroom, and I banned it before, but now I have them doing a lot of collaboration in class where they have. To information gathering and they need their cell phone yeah and so like now it's like what do you do i you have know? gone use it I yeah yeah gone, exactly yeah. i mean go with no, but no, no, yeah no, no. But i have yeah. gone the absolute other direction i say the only the only rule i have is don't take phone calls yeah if you to get a phone call stand up and leave you don't have to ask permission you're an adult and get out mm -hmm. stand up go out in the hallway take your call and then come back but the access to google and the access to uh all of that is so valuable. So you know, there was a, another presentation that I saw, uh, and the presenter had asked, all right, so please tell me who uh, Mitra Sugata, is that right? And who, who he is. So he had actually said the name right, put it up on the board. So people just pulled out their phones and started looking him up. So this, this was the whole of the mall guy who did the self-access spot in mm -hmm. India and then repeated it in England to great success. And it's there. It's I mean and the students will do it. I'm like, I don't give them if they ask me for an information question, I don't give them the answer. I tell them to look it up. If they're asking me for a process question, then I will help them. 
But for basic information, you don't waste my time. That's what Google is for. Google is your friend. Like, go figure it out. All right. We good? Excellent. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much.